Thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I really uh, enjoyed the, this morning's talks and hope I can start this off uh, a little momentum after lunch. So I'm going to leap right into a little bit of background on uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so the neurodegenerative disorders can be classified clinically, and they're also classifiable histopathologically uh, by the uh, nature of the proteins that accumulate in the brain and how they're distributed. So uh, beta amyloidoses include Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. They're the tauopathies. Um, Alzheimer's, uh, PSP, and chron chronic traumatic encephalopathy among those. The alpha-synucleinopathies, uh, which include Parkinson's disease, uh, again, uh, DLB, multiple system atrophy. And then there are other uh, uh, proteins and um, uh, aggregations in the brain, like TDP43. So clinically, these diseases overlap, and uh, pathologically, these diseases overlap, which makes them difficult to study. So there are few or no diagnostic tests. They're clinically heterogeneous. They're pathologically heterogeneous. They're etiologically heterogeneous. And they're diseases of aging. So there's a long preclinical period. And the exposures that we're interested in may have occurred uh, decades before the symptoms present, which makes them really hard to, uh, to characterize. And then there's competitive mortality. So people who've got an underlying disease process might die from some other competing cause before that. Uh, that disease manifests. So a little bit of background on Parkinson's disease. It's the most common cause of Parkinsonism. Uh, it was fully described in 1817 by James Parkinson, and it affects a, around a, a million in the US, though we don't actually know how many are affected. It's just a guess. It's about a 2% prevalence over age 65, and the cause is unknown in better than 90% of cases. What we do know for sure about Parkinson's is that uh, it's a disease of aging. You can see it's extremely rare uh, under age 50 and then takes off exponentially. But at all ages, uh, men are more commonly uh, affected than women. The pathology, uh, the classic pathology involves the substantia nigra pars compacta, it's the loss of pigmented dopaminergic neurons. And you can see here the PD uh, uh, brainstem uh, is, has lost the, the characteristic pigmentation. And uh, histopathologically, we see these Lewy bodies. Uh, they're uh, intracytoplasmic. And you can see here, this is a, a pigmented nigral neuron because these are uh, neuromelanin granules. But Parkinson's is a systemic disease. Uh, it affects the myenteric plexus here on the left in the gut. It affects the olfactory bulb. And it affects most of the organs uh, in the body, organ systems. It's increasing rapidly. This is uh, prevalence. Uh, projected from 2005 to 2030. And you can see the areas with the fastest growth are the recently developed nations like Brazil, China, and India. Incidence is difficult to study because diagnostic criteria have changed over the years. Um, but uh, this one paper from uh, Mayo Clinic suggests that uh, there is a gradual increase of about 25% uh, per decade, at least in men. It's less clear in women. So some background on Alzheimer's. Uh, it's the most common neurodegenerative disease, uh, comprises 70% uh, or so of, the de of all dementias. Uh, other common causes are vascular, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's, and CTE. Uh, it affects more than 5 million Americans, um, and uh, prevalence is uh, very high over age 85, it's 30% estimated. And the classic pathology are uh, aggregates of uh, amyloid, beta amyloid, uh, which are here, amyloid plaques by the, the black arrow, and uh, phosphorylated uh, neurofibrillary tau tangles by the red arrow. And as I mentioned earlier, there are other proteins uh, as well. Trends for Alzheimer's, the, uh, this is change in uh, causes of death from 2000 to 2015. And there's been a more than doubling uh, of Alzheimer's as a cause of death. But uh, incidence, as others have mentioned earlier, uh, appears to be on the decline. This is all, all causes of dementia, but uh, for Alzheimer's as well. And uh, it's regardless of, uh, of age group. I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to make the case that environment is a major determinant of neurodegenerative disease risk, first with Parkinson's. So this is a debate that's been going on for 140 years or so. Uh, Charcot thought it was not familial, and Gowers thought that it was. 
And so fast forward to 1999, and this is a, a, a study that we conducted uh, when I was very, very young. And um, <laughs> so we, this was a, the, a very large twin study, 32,000 twins, uh, uh, the population-based uh, military cohort from uh, born 1917 to 27. The idea is that if a disease is predominantly genetic, then there's going to be high concordance for the disease in identical twins, and there's going to be modest or low concordance in fraternal twins. And what we found was that concordance rates were very high in the monozygotic pairs when disease began before age 50, but that when disease began at the typical age, over 50, that heritability was only around 7%. So we concluded from this that environment is a major contributor to the cause of typical Parkinson's disease. And to drive that point home, I have a very short video. I'll tell you what you were going to see. So um, this gentleman's extremely bradykinetic, kinetic, rigid, not moving. Uh, in the next image, there's a, a woman with a unilateral rest tremor of her right hand that looks exactly like Parkinson's disease. And in the third uh, vignette, there's uh, a gentleman with uh, postural reflex impairment, so uh, impaired balance. And those are the cardinal features of Parkinson's disease. And these individuals all presented around the same time in the, in the mid-1980s to emergency rooms in Silicon Valley. And it turned out they'd all injected this substance, MPTP, uh, the chemistry which has been worked out. It crosses, freely crosses the blood-brain barrier. It is converted into MPP plus uh, in astrocytes. And uh, then it's taken up by dopaminergic neurons, where it's a potent mitochondrial complex one poison. And so this really launched the search for environmental risk factors for Parkinson's disease. So this is MPP plus that affects complex one. Turns out that the uh, insecticide rotenone is also a potent inhibitor of complex one and is associated with Parkinson's risk. The herbicide Paraquat, uh, one of the most frequently used herbicides in the country, though banned in Europe and about to be banned in China, uh, is also a potent uh, redox agent that uh, is toxic to mitochondria. And uh, the solvents, uh, trichloroethylene and PERC, degreasers and dry cleaning solvents, they are converted into an intermediary compound, Teclo, which is also a potent complex one inhibitor. So we think we understand some of the real mechanisms involved. So just to review the uh, risk associations, uh, head trauma uh, is, is fairly well established. Uh, pesticides, uh, though it's rare that actual agents have been linked. Uh, rural residents and farming have been linked. Reduced risk, uh, smoking and drinking coffee. So they're like that Jim Jarmusch film, some of you may have seen. And um, uh, possibly some dietary associations, high physical activity might be protective and non anti-inflammatories. Environment and Alzheimer's. Uh, there's less data here than for Parkinson's, I, I, I believe. And uh, the heritability is estimated at about 50% for Alzheimer's. And this, um, I could have shown you one of these for Parkinson's as well. What this shows is on the, on the, um, on the x-axis is the frequency of the variant. So these variants, these genetic variants are very, free, very common. And on the y-axis is the penetrance or the amount of risk conferred by having the variant. And um, so these, these high-risk Mendelian uh, variants are very rare, uh, and these uh, frequent low-risk variants are very common. And there's this outlier in the center here. This is APOE4. That's both uh, high-risk and uh, frequent. So just to quickly summarize some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's, these include uh, smoking, uh, possibly air pollution that I'll touch on in a little bit, and uh, comorbidities, and then reduced risk uh, education, cognitive reserve, uh, seem to reduce risk and IQ. So we've been seeing some data from this morning about uh, associations with IQ in young children uh, r related to air pollution. And so those might very well be relevant uh, to Alzheimer's as well. So very quickly, what might be different about the young brain that puts it at risk. Uh, I'm going to just name a couple of th things. So one is uh, the transit of xenobiotics across the, the blood-brain barrier or the blood uh, CSF barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is established quite early in life, um, but these um, there's a variety of these uh, xenobiotic transporters on membranes. They bring some of them bring substances in to the parenchyma, some of them extrude stuff out to the circulation. 
And you can see the, the ones that are in orange are the transporter types um, that uh, are low in the perinatal period and increase during adulthood. And the ones that are blue are, uh, are highly expressed in perinatal period and decrease in adulthood. So are there are differences in how the body might um, get exposed, how the brain might get exposed to xenobiotics. There's also a larger surface area to volume ratio in the young, higher respiratory rates, slower metabolism of xenobiotics. And there's this issue of priming, microglial sensitization, as well as priming of the, the microbiome. I'll get to that in a little bit. This is an, an example of genomic priming. Uh, so the epigenome, these, these are uh, identical twins, these mice. Um, this is the agouti mouse. And um, the mouse, uh, this is the normal phenotype, so-called normal. And uh, on the right is its identical twin, um, except that the, the, the mother, well, they're not identical twins, but they're same breed. Uh, so the mother of this mouse was given a high folate diet during pregnancy. And so it's got a different uh, coat color. It's not obese, and it's less likely to develop cancer. So now some evidence, even though it's difficult to link early life uh, risk factors with late life diseases. So this is a follow-up on the twin study. Uh, in 1999, some of them, many of them were still alive, so we didn't follow them all the way during their period of high risk. So we've done that now with the National Death Index. And what we found was we confirmed our original finding that um, uh, heritability is low. And, um, but the most interesting thing that we found, so this, this curve shows the cumulative risk in the second twin uh, by uh, monozygotic in blue and dizygotic in green. But what we found was that the concordance rate for the dizygotic twins was 13%. And what is expected in typical siblings is 3 to 4%. So what's different about, about uh, fraternal twins and, and siblings is simply the period in which they were raised was the same. And the intrauterine environment is the same. So uh, Parkinson's disease takes a long time to present. And uh, pathology is, is uh, present very early. Pathology starts down here in the medulla and in the olfactory bulb. And it's only when you get to about stage four disease that it actually gets to the substantia nigra. So there's a very long evolution. And peripheral pathology, such as seen in the olfactory bulb, uh, may precede the CNS pathology by decades. Strange looking. Similarly, um, not quite right. It's very odd. Um, what this slide was supposed to show is that uh, there is neurofibrillary pathology in Alzheimer's that is present very early as well. About 20% of individuals under the age of 30 have neurofibrillary tangles in their brains already. And this was a, a, a pathology <coughs> series by Brock. So both of these conditions probably start way, way before they present. So microglial priming, we heard a little bit about the, the lipopolysaccharide model. So LPS is also uh, is bacterial endotoxin. It's in the gram-negative bacterial membrane. A single uh, very low concentration injection will cause immediate microglial activation. That's a peripheral injection. And uh, it's very specific for the substantia nigra with gradual progressive loss of dopaminergic neurons. So in this model, which is really looking very strange, um, so LPS or saline is given uh, to mice at day five. And then as adults, they're given a dose of rotenone or saline. What this is trying to show is that if you prime a neonatal mouse with tiny amounts of lipopolysaccharide, uh, and then you hit them with rotenone as adults, they're about five times more sensitive to the rotenone, and they'll have uh, markedly accelerated dopaminergic neuron degeneration. 
Let's see if this slide works. So this is the same concept, but it's in utero. So a single maternal injection, gest gestation day 10, and um, they, uh, they reduced uh, dopaminergic neurons in pups, but the rate of loss is unchanged. And then again, a subtoxic dose of rotenone is given uh, to the adult rat and, and mouse. And here you can see um, that rotenone alone has a very minimal effect. But in the LPS primed uh, individual, there's a, a marked loss of dopaminergic uh, neurons in the substantia nigra. So let's talk some more about iron. Iron dysregulation is well established uh, in Parkinson's disease and probably also in Alzheimer's. There's increased free iron. Uh, it's not bound to ferritin in the substantia nigra as much as, a, as in a control brain. Uh, and it seems to be related to uh, expression of amyloid precursor protein uh, as relates to Alzheimer's disease. Everyone remembers the Fenton reaction from uh, inorganic chemistry. This uh, hydroxyl radical is extremely reactive. It damages uh, membranes. And human sources of iron could be dietary, or could be inhaled, as we saw earlier today. So in this model, um, uh, mice were uh, administered uh, doses equivalent to infant formula supplemented with iron uh, from days 10 to 17, and then they were sacrificed at various periods. Half of each group received an MPTP injection prior to sacrifice. So here's the, um, the two-month group, 12-month sacrifice, 16 and 24. And you can see here that in the 24-month, simply uh, a high iron diet was associated with a reduction in, um, in uh, striatal dopamine content. And then uh, after um, uh, MPTP, as an adult, these mice that were primed as neonates with a high iron diet had a markedly uh, greater loss of, uh, of dopamine, here you can see in the green boxes, after a dose of uh, uh, MPTP. A little bit about lead. Uh, there's an extensive literature, of course, relating to uh, cognitive uh, declines associated with, with low-dose lead. Uh, there's some evidence linking uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, using bone lead studies. And the proposed mechanisms include epigenetics, oxidative stress, and protein aggregation. So this is a really interesting uh, study uh, of mice fed uh, 200 parts per million of lead uh, as neonates. And then looking at the cortical expression of Alzheimer of, of uh, amyloid precursor protein throughout life. And you can see there it's moving along quite nicely here. And then in mid to late life, the expression of, of amyloid precursor protein takes off in the, lead in the, in the mice that were exposed to lead as neonates. Uh, and this strongly suggests an epigenetic effect. Dosing them with lead in, in midlife did not cause this effect. And some more evidence that this is epigenetic-based, um, this is a maternal bone lead measured and correlating with uh, cord blood uh, meth DNA methylation. And you can see as the maternal patellar bone lead increases, the uh, DNA methylation decreases with a nice dose response. So decreased methylation is associated with increased gene expression. So that may be underlying this effect on the amyloid precursor protein. A little bit about pesticides. So um, the PD, Parkinson's epidemiology is very consistent with regard to pesticides. Uh, it's rare that a specific agent is identified, but regardless of how pesticide exposure is assessed, uh, they're generally here on this meta-analysis, you can see to the right of, uh, of unity, and the meta uh, uh, oh, odds ratio is, is uh, 1.7. The epidemiology for Alzheimer's and ALS is less consistent, and uh, it's thought that gene and pesticide interactions are likely important. So here's a model, uh, uh, Dr. Corey Selecta's model, uh, dosing um, animals early in life uh, with Manab, Paraquat, or both, ages uh, 5 to 19, and then redosing half of them at age 7 months. And what you can see here is that they all have, when so my cursor. So there's a modest effect of MANAB here in the light blue, paraquat, and the dark gray, and uh, 
both paraquat and manab here, uh, if they're dosed early or if they're dosed as adults only. But if they're dosed both early and as adults, you can see this uh, synergism. So this is a theme I'm, I'm harping on, um, that um, it's this multiple hits that seem to be really important in these diseases. Uh, so there's, there's not a lot of data on pesticides and Alzheimer's risk, um, but there's this interesting study that looked at uh, DDE, which is the main metabolite of DDT. It's persistent in serum with a half-life of around 10 years. And you can see here, this is control serum on the left and Alzheimer's serum on the right, and there's uh, a markedly higher uh, average level of DDE, and the highest tertile was associated with a fourfold increased risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, and again, there's a good mechanistic basis for this. This is looking at the effect of DDT or DDE on amyloid precursor protein expression uh, in culture. And you can see that clearly they're affecting uh, the expression of the precursor protein. A little bit on particulates, since that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. And um, so there's an increasingly compelling link uh, with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and cognitive decline with uh, pollution, air pollution. The association with Parkinson's is, is much weaker and less consistent. And uh, the same, uh, the usual mechanisms uh, apply here. So inflammation, micro microglial activation, oxidative stress. The question is still outstanding whether this is primarily a peripheral, peripherally mediated effect. So jazzing up the peripheral immune system, which then directly impacts the brain or whether it's direct, so these, these um, particulates getting directly into the brain through the olfa olfactory bulb. So um, this study is looking in adults uh, with dementia and uh, proximity to roads. We've heard a little bit about proximity to roads. Uh, so this, each of these is, uh, each of these blocks here is a, uh, a distance from the road. So this is less than 50 meters. This is a Canadian study. And you can see a, a nice dose response with distance from roads uh, associated with, uh, with dementia, incident dementia risk. But uh, we don't see any relationship with Parkinson's or with multiple sclerosis. But what about early life air pollution? So that's adult air pollution. Um, so there have been a number of these papers, many of you are probably familiar with them, uh, by uh, Calderon Garcia Duenas out of Mexico City. It's an autopsy series. So these individuals died suddenly, uh, mostly from trauma, but not from head trauma, apparently. Um, and uh, they find remarkable amounts of Alzheimer's pathology in relatively young individuals from a very highly polluted city, Mexico City. So this is showing a beta deposition in a 38-year-old. And what's interesting around that star, that's a blood vessel. So a beta in particular seems to be um, expressed around small blood vessels. And this is showing <clears throat> here on the right, this bar is uh, synuclein in the olfactory bulb. And these, this bar here, we'll just look at this one, is, uh, is tau in the olfactory bulb. And these are from individuals who died between the ages of 1 and 20. And you can see that already there is a considerable deposition of alpha-synuclein aggregates in the olfactory bulb and, uh, and uh, phosphorylated uh, tau protein. So again, it looks like these processes are starting very early. And this in particular um, caught my eye, though this isn't exactly the image. Um, but this image would show uh, Lewy pathology, alpha-synuclein aggregates, uh, consistent with Parkinson's disease histopathology in the olfactory bulb of a three-year-old. Uh, and finally, I want to show this, the, the, getting back to nanoparticles, which are these ultrafines that are less than 100 nanometers. Um, this is an autopsy series both in Mexico City and in Manchester, England, both fairly polluted environments. I, uh, I haven't been to Manchester, but it's my understanding. And uh, these are particles in frontal cortex um, on the right here. Uh, they're thought to be iron-derived uh, particles that are resonant in, in the cortex. 
And if you don't look, you won't find. And these may be much more frequent than, than uh, anyone has been aware. So this is the overriding model. And this, again, is from um, Deborah Corey Selecta. <clears throat> Others have proposed this for, for many years as well, that there's a number of possible models here. So there's the possibility that an early life insult knocks out some significant proportion of your dopaminergic neurons, and then you continue down the line at a, approximately the normal rate of attrition of those cells. And if you get down here, you'll become symptomatic. So if you live long enough, the theory is, this may, may or may not be true, everyone's going to get this disease because dopaminergic cells are highly stressed. There's a lot of oxidative stress, and neuromelanin uh, is a magnet for this. Um, but if you knock off 20% of your cells, you're going to get there 20 years earlier. Another possibility is that the developmental insult doesn't change, doesn't kill the cells, but it, it increases their rate of death over the life course. And so you're more likely, uh, given this faster rate of decline, to become symptomatic. Um, but I think the important thing is this multiple hit hypothesis uh, that shows up in most of the animal models and probably in the human models as well, in the human epidemiology, is that uh, the initial hit primes the system, and then the system overreacts to the subsequent insult, uh, whether it be a toxicant, whether it be uh, any, something driving inflammation. Uh, the system is primed, and it remembers how to react, and it reacts. And that's what leads to cell death. So there's very little, not surprisingly, human epidemiologic data on early life risk factors because we would have to collect those data 70 years before the, the disease. But there's a growing understanding of the underlying mechanisms, and there are very compelling and reproducible animal and cellular models. The results are consistent that these early insults prime the system, and later uh, insults accelerate the, the process. And uh, genes and environment are probably converging on common pathways that involve inflammation, mitochondrial uh, damage, uh, and protein aggregation. And finally, because these diseases evolve over decades, that's a hopeful thing uh, because it means that if we can figure out how to intervene in the, in the process, that we can prevent uh, the disease from manifesting. And I want to thank all my collaborators, uh, in particular Carly Tanner at UCSF. And um, thank you. Take some questions.